Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Vanil Patel. I um, am also an engineer at TCREL, along with Dave and many other fine folks. Not as many fine folks as all of the people I've had to leave at, uh, at OCM to you at X. Um, but yeah, I'm going to just talk through some of the technical principles and details about how what what open at, what the OpenEdX platform is uh, at extremely high levels. And we'll sort of start from there. And uh, we'll sort of talk through a bit of the, the technical details and then a bit of the concepts that we try to use to make growing and maintaining this system somewhat sane, not exactly sane, but sane adjacent. Um, so, so the OpenEx platform is uh, a Python Django REST service, has React microfrontends, has a bunch of server-side templates, millions of lines of code across 200 plus repositories with hundreds of people across the globe uh, who have been working on it for over 10 years. Um, it's it's had a bit, it's, it's had a life, you know, it has, it's, had, it's an entity unto itself, um, more so now than ever before. Um, and uh, it's very interesting and fun. Um, that said, there are some some very like consistent pieces of it. Um, the backend stack um, is is all uh, Python, Python 3.8, Django, Django REST framework comes in pretty heavily. We use Celery for asynchronous task queuing uh, and PyTest for most of our testing. So if you're looking on the technical side, those are that's where most of our backend code is going to be. Is one of these things. If you're familiar with these technologies, you'll be able to find your way around. Um, supporting data servers, we use MySQL, we use Memcache, we use Redis, we use Elasticsearch, which will be replaced with OpenSearch or removed in some other way in the next six months to a year. Um, and then there is uh, currently rumblings of uh, asynchronous events via Kafka for inter-service communication. Um, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, we currently also run MongoDB as a way of storing our course content. Um, and as well as our forums data from the Ruby Sinatra forums, both of which we're trying to move away from. Um, and you'll probably hear a lot more about that um, via the deprecation announcements that are going to happen in the next little while and the ones that have already happened. Um, cool. So um, that's our back end. Our front end um, is, you know, it turns out it's in JavaScript, just like many other browser front ends. Uh, we use JavaScript with React and Redux. Uh, I know it's very surprising. Um, the um, it, we don't have a single front end. Uh, instead, we have lots of different single page apps that we call micro front ends that make up the entirety of the OpenEdX front end. Um, we use uh, Paragon is a design system that was built in house that was based on Bootstrap that um, enhances Bootstrap to provide a lot more sort of Excel accessibility capabilities built in, so that we hopefully don't have to think about those and trip over accessibility, and we can truly make the course, uh, the course content in the platform accessible to everyone. Um, and so there's also a lot of shared content for the front end in the front end platform, which has sort of classic problems already solved in a standard way. These are the paved, paved roads of the front end. Um, and then we have uh, the front end build system, which is meant to ease the deployment and build processes. Um, here again, as I mentioned before, there's, we still have a lot of server render templates. The old front end still lives in many places, and we're working to move away from those towards micro front ends. Um, we also have a couple of iterations of the UI framework and component libraries uh, that we are slowly trying to move away from as well. So, so uh, what does that actually mean? Those back ends and front ends. Here are some, here are the services that make up the platform today. There's lots of, as you can see, user-facing MFEs, user-facing websites that have legacy templates, iOS and Android app, a bunch of back-end services that provide APIs that allow us to sort of present interesting things and, and sort of maintain different areas of concern and different domains of knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here. It's it's fairly large and vast and, and you know, I don't Think, you know, I don't think even Dave or I would, would say we know any of this, all of this very well. It's all sort of knowing what the sort of general shape of these things are is very helpful. And then you learn when you get there. Um, that's good. So because we have all these different services, one of the things that I want to mention is sort of data flow, right? Um, these different services all sort of maintain different domains. And the idea is that they are somewhat independent in how they maintain those domains. 
um, that means that the sources of truth for data are distributed across the system. Um, today, a lot of what we do is a way of sharing that data across the systems rather than doing inline calls across many services and sort of risk um, sort of uh, downtime as a result of, of dependent services. We do a lot of, a lot of data replication. So data gets replicated from sources to destinations often sort of in, in the background uh, so that we don't have to rely on sort of the combined uptime of all of the services for any given thing to work. Um, there are exceptions to this, but that's the general rule. That's the baseline we've been working with uh, for a while uh, with a hope to move more towards an eventing-based architecture in the future. Um, development environments. Um, we, we love our developers. There's so many of them across, uh, and we have a lot of different ways of building and developing code for the platform. Um, historically, over the last three years or so, we've, we've had a Docker-based development environment, which we call DevStack uh, imaginatively. Um, it is, um, the images there are actually built using the same Ansible code that is used to build and deploy our production systems for a lot of our legacy production systems that are not running in Kubernetes. Um, and again, I'm using the same us as Dave for to you at X because have it. Um, so uh, you, us, we, anyway. Um, so uh, unfortunately, Ansible and Docker and development did not play well together. The, the dev system tended to be, is, is fairly heavy. Um, as a result of that uh, and recognizing that one of our community members, Regis Bimo, um, built a cleaner, simpler system that was saner for his brain. Um, and over time, it has shown to be saner for more people's brains and has sort of grown in capability. Um, it is currently the official uh, OpenEdX distribution um, as of two releases ago, I want to say. Um, but uh, that'll correct me later. Um, it's, uh, it tends to be fairly fast and lightweight. It's an extremely extensible platform for running many services, which is actually very exciting. And uh, at the moment, there is, an, there is an initiative that is being spearheaded to move towards Tutor and away from DevStack for development environments. Um, and part of that is sort of gap analysis and figuring out what capabilities it needs for it to be a successful development environment for everybody. Uh, at large places like uh, to you, which uh, runs way more services and way more pieces of the platform than other places. Um, all right, so those those are the sort of guts of the the, the sort of physical parts of the platform. Um, but now, sort of more theoretically, the architectural principles that we're following, and these are the things that we've learned over time. Uh, help us think about the platform more holistically and help us answer those higher level questions when we need to. Um, we've been moving towards this concept, uh, which we're calling Bs, uh, which stands for uh, boundaries, extensions, events, and standards. Um, sort of those are, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what all those means. Um, so starting with, with, with boundaries, uh, there's sort of a couple of different ways to think about this, but. The biggest one is is, is domain boundaries. Um, so, because the OpenEdX platform has solved so many problems for so many people, there are many different needs. There are many different personas. There's many different aspects of the problem that people need to solve. Right. Uh, just taking a look at, at this diagram here, there are there's authoring, there's the actual learning, so the experience of the learner versus the experience of the author. There's the catalog to be able to find courses and do that course discovery. There's a bunch of enterprise needs that are specific to reporting and, and management of, of enterprise customers. There's analytics that sort of supports all of those different pieces. Um, so in each of these domains, there, that, there tend to be different concepts. There tend to be different ways of representing things. Um, one of the biggest examples here is a course what a course means to a learner or to an author or in a catalog can be different. Um, so we can, um, you'll see in some places in the system, something called a course run, which is essentially one instance of a course at one period of time. Uh, in other places, that's just called the course because that was the concept of course that existed in that system historically. In other places, the idea of a course is all of the instances of that course that have ever run um, and those are all, there's a course concept and then course runs concept to represent the individuals. 
Um, so there's lots of these different, uh, so knowing and, and setting boundaries and being clear about how we communicate about different things in different spaces uh, helps us more clearly communicate the right things at the right time. Um, so so we're, we, we talk a lot about boundaries and we talk a lot about domains and what domain we're, we're working in. How, how can we separate these domains further and make it clear when we're crossing these domain boundaries? Um, we also, um, extensions is super important. Um, as an open source platform and as a platform that had to support historically the edX.org use cases, but still allow for innovation and still allow for lots of experimentation on the platform, making major changes to the core is extremely risky, right? The number of people it impacts, over a thousand deployments could be impacted by a bad change in the core. Um, over 50,000 courses might be, might be hurt if we don't do the right things there. So um, as we sort of grow and mature, we're thinking a lot more about extensibility as a way to allow people to have more autonomy, right? So if we have places where people can plug into the platform, then we allow for them to build their experimental features autonomously because they can, they can make use of sort of clear interfaces. Uh, and they can they can try out things that we might not have time for that we don't have that may not may not scale for every use case um, without having to make major changes. Um, you'll see here sort of we talk about a core where there are technical innovations, um, pedagogical in innovations is um, and then sort of business innovation. So like there's all these different ecosystems and different pieces of the ecosystem that have different needs. Um, and we see extensions as a way of allowing for that sort of, that the vitality of the system to sort of exist and be like the end, like allowing people to try strange and new things. Uh, and uh, an example of that is our oldest uh, extension system is actually the X block system. Uh, X blocks are components that can be embedded uh, in lots of places, but let's just say in courseware uh, is the place where they can be embedded. Um, and they are used to build different problem types, different, uh, different labs, different experimentation, different ways of teaching. Um, these are some of the examples that there exist. It is It has allowed people to do things like experiment with spaced repetition, even though the platform as a whole doesn't support it, uh, has allowed people to do things like collect analytics data and analyze how people answer questions. Uh, people have built all kinds of different interactions on top of it. Um, it is arguably, you know, and we want to sort of push this experimentation and innovation capability throughout the platform so that we can, we can see more variability in how people are, are building things. Um, I think that vibrancy in the ecosystem is something that we're move, we're pushing towards a lot because it will help us. It helps everybody when there is more variety, right? When we can see people trying things, we can see more things working. Um, from an, from a two year perspective, you can imagine having the ability to have a a a laboratory that you don't have to necessarily invest in day to day that lets you uh, lets you see what kind of things are working in the world um, and the community is, I think, a really important part of that. Um, the other architectural principle um, is events. So as we talked about before, uh, we currently do a lot of data replication uh, that can be fairly costly. The time, the latency of data, uh, like the, the freshness of data is one of the, the sort of major issues there. Um, events help us keep the systems decoupled, but they do it in a way that is a little bit more timely and a little bit more lively and still allows us um, to have that sort of keep things uh, further separate. So um, in process, we use Django Signals pretty heavily today. Um, Django Signals is essentially a sort of a mini event system that you can run inside of your Django, um, Django process. Um, Recently, uh, Edgenex, one of our uh, ecosystem firms, has invested heavily in uh, OpenEdX events, which is a, a move towards standardizing event types that people can build new uh, plugins and extensions on top of. So rather than depending directly on signals that exist in the platform, 
defining them in this uh, in this library that people can depend on and build on top of sort of eases the burden of development for new extensions and plugins um, and allows for people to integrate fairly closely with different parts of the system while still maintaining sort of that separation of, of ownership and separation of control. Um, and, uh, and over time, our hope is that OpenEdX events will actually also have uh, the tooling and capabilities to start taking these in-process events and also start pushing them out of process across um, to, other, to other services. Um, and then last but not least, not in the least, is, uh, is the idea of standards. So um, I'm like, the, the, tech, the, the ed tech industry has exploded, right? Um, it, even more so in the last couple of years, but, but even before that, it's been around for a long time. People have been working on a lot of ways of thinking about using technology to teach people and to not leverage that seems like an oversight. Um, so I think we are uh, in a lot of places, we're solving a lot of problems that other people are also thinking about and leveraging the community um, and leveraging the, the sort of wider education technology world, um, I think sort of enables us to be, uh, to focus more on the core problem of getting the most information and education to the people who need it. Um, so to that end, we've worked with a lot of, uh, we've, we've been working with, uh, with a lot of different industry standards. Um, edX platform currently has LTI capabilities. Um, it, we have eventing via XAPI and Caliper, which are sort of other eventing systems that exist already that integrate with uh, with learner record systems. Um, there are are there are other parts of the platform that could be integrated further with existing um, record stores or um, rosters. And, and we're thinking a lot about sort of the transferability of courses, being able to import courses that are in other formats using common cartridge and things like that. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of standards out there and, and taking some time and effort to evaluate them and, and figure out where they might fit in and where we might fit in into the larger um, learning, uh, learning systems that places already have, um, I think is an important sort of aspect of how we can think about where, where, OpenEdX, where the OpenEdX platform needs to evolve. 